First Timothy chapter five. Today I want to talk to you about caring for leaders. Paul in his letter to Timothy instructs him on caring for leaders. Verse 17 through 25. What I'm going to do is take you through explaining these verses to you. That really isn't the sermon itself. That's my explanation so that, you, so that I know you know what this passage means. And then I'm going to talk to you and say, what do, what do elders and overseers and leaders in the church do? What are the difficulties they face? And why would anyone want to do this? When I look at the difficulties, you're going to ask that question. Well, why would anybody want to do that job then? And then we'll look at some practical ways of honoring leaders. I heard somebody say once, not only do good leaders make a good church, but a good church makes good leaders. We often think of the responsibility that leaders and ministers at every level have to the people they serve. But it's a two-way street. The people they serve also have a responsibility to those who care for them and shepherd and guard them and pray for them and minister to them. It's a two-way street. We need to be praying for those who minister to us. Many of us, I think in time the Lord would have all of us move into various positions of leadership. Just the fact that you grow wise and grow older, that you learn to do things well, that you step out in your gifts. In time, you become a person who not only does ministry, but a person who transfers what you've learned to others. You become a leader. The Lord raises up his people, I think really all of them, in different seasons, to lead his body and to minister. And so what I'm going to talk about today goes two ways for all of us. All of us follow somebody myself included, all of us lead in some areas. Maybe it's in our family, maybe it's at work, but we have leadership responsibilities. And so we're looking at the two different directions of it. Let's see what Paul says to Timothy, and then I'll get into those other comments. Verse 17, he says, the elders, and that word elders, Paul uses synonymously, as far as I can see, with the term overseer. It's meaning a uh, House church pastor, those who pastor and teach and minister to the body in whatever uh, capacity. He says, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. So he first of all says, Timothy, they ought to have double honor. By that he means they ought to be given financial support. First level of honor is to respect and submit to our leaders, to let them lead and show respect for them. Not to make their lives miserable, but to follow them. Second level is, he says they are worthy of being supported financially. If they're going to work hard at preaching and teaching and preparing lessons and traveling and uh, speaking to the, to the flock, they ought to be supported. The word honor is used over there in verse 3. When Paul talks about honoring widows, and there he was talking about putting them on the financial roll, where they were helping uh, widows who were poor in the church. Here, by honor, again, the second, the double honor, the second level of honor, is that they be financially supported as well as respected. And then he, he undergirds that with a, with a verse of scripture from Deuteronomy 25. He says, for scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he's threshing and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Paul really picks that same verse up and talks a great deal about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And what he says, he says, Paul, God was not simply speaking about oxen or concerned about oxen, was he? But he was concerned about us. Well, you go back to Deuteronomy and it's a passage where God had a whole bunch of things he said about caring for the powerless and the poor seeing that they weren't exploited or misused. And then right in the middle of that, he makes this statement, just right out of the blue, you shall not muzzle the oxen while he's threshing. You think, what's that about? And then it goes on talking about other things. Well, actually, it's quite consistent. Here's the picture. You've got this ox, and it's either dragging some kind of, of threshing sledge over the grain to break it up, and there may be, or maybe it's tied to a thing where it's going around in a circle, that kind of thing. And a farmer might well just put a muzzle on the ox so the ox doesn't bend down and eat from the grain while he's working in it. 
But God says that that violates a principle of mine. When someone labors in an area, they have a right to enjoy the profits of it. They should partake in the blessing of that for which they labor in. Not only should it be true of humans, but right down to, the, to animals themselves. They should take the muzzle off that ox and let the ox feed as it labors in threshing. If it's true for an ox, you know it's true for a person, right? And that'd be something if any of you are in business or you're in various things. This is the kind of principle that you say, now how does that play out? How does that kind of thing play out in my business life or in my family? How do I see that those who labor in an area enjoy also the fruits of it? And he's talking here about this, the spiritual ministry of, of pastors and teachers. And he says, if they labor in the church, they have a right to share in the financial support if they work hard at preaching and teaching, sort of in proportion. All right, next he says, verse 19, do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Here he's worried, concerned about protecting against false accusation. If we allowed one person's word, unsubstantiated, to charge a leader with something, uh, some moral failure or something, the devil would simply bring false witnesses in by the dozens and we would have it, we would, uh, we would just shut down one thing after another. In Israel, one person's word could not find another, one, uh, one person guilty. It's my word against yours. You hear that said? One person's word against another. Well, that's even in our, our modern law now. Paul says, if that was the protection for the people of Israel, that there had to be two or three who bore witness if the person denied the allegation, then the same would be true in the church. And so if somebody comes and makes an allegation, my job always is, is to say, who else? Bring the person in, let them talk together, see if, I, if, I, if the person they accuse is indeed said, well, yes, I did that. Well, then that's a different thing. But if said, I certainly did not do that, this person said, yes, you did. Well, I'm not going to move till I get another witness. Because that's simply scripture. So there's a protection. Next, he says, those who, rebuke in, who continue in sin, verse 20, rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest will also be fearful of sinning. Well, when a, when a leader does sin, you don't just whisk it out the back door or push it under a rug. The leader is to stand in front of the people they lead. We've done this with many church pastors. We've done this with, with various leaders. Not in, doesn't have to be in front of everybody, but in front of those who've trusted them, in front of those who've looked to them for care, and stand up and apologize for having failed one's trust. Now, that's not easy to do, but it's healthy. And Paul says it puts a fear of sinning in the church. What it does is say, oh, I see. The rules go for you just as well as they do for me. And people, they do. They do. In fact, the next point Paul will make has to do with that. He says, I solemnly, boy, and he makes it strongly. Look at this, 21. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his cho chosen angels. How would he say it any stronger? with God watching you <laughs> to maintain these things without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality, neither with favor nor prejudice. When you deal with a leader, you be totally honest. Fair's fair, right's right, wrong's wrong. There aren't two different sets of rules. So very often you'll be in a church where some leader will do something wrong and the person who brings the accusation is actually punished, maybe thrown out of the church and talked about, while the leader who is sinning is totally ignored or maybe given a little slap on the hand and treated in a way that nobody else in the church would have been treated had they done the same thing. I do not want to see hands, but I know some of you have been through those episodes. It's degrading and it's shameful. It's specifically spoken against here. A leader is to be treated with the same justice and the same discipline that anyone else is to be treated with. And Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God and Christ and his chosen angels. Timothy, you do absolutely fairly. You know,
know, when somebody's a leader and somebody's made a big impact, or maybe the whole church is gathered or, you know, some, around somebody's leadership and they fail, the fear goes into everybody. If we discipline that person, the whole church will come apart. And so suddenly they're given a level of, of grace that's really sad. I can think of, I won't mention the person, but I can think of one leader I saw, and he was very famous, you all would know. And when he sinned, his denomination tried to discipline him. And he refused to be submitted to their discipline and defied them and went on. I'll tell you what I thought in my, my head. I said, if that man would submit to the discipline of his denomination humbly, he would probably be out of the ministry for three to five years while they watched him and corrected him and saw that things were in order. But when he came back, he would come back as a hero who had failed, who had humbled himself under the, under, under, to, his, to, his, to the other leaders of the church, allowed them to discipline him, had learned his lesson, and would come back as a champion of those who had failed, but now were given a second chance by the mercy of God, and would probably have a ministry bigger than what he had before. That's what I thought. Did he do that? No, he did not. He flaunted everybody. And now, once in a while, you can grow, see this grotesque show as you go on by him on television. And there he is with the anointing gone, trudging on, and it's a tragic display. Paul says, discipline leaders. Now, that doesn't mean trash them. It means discipline them like everybody else, which means set them out of their authority. Apologize to the congregation. Remove them when they violated a major thing. And then restore and pray like you would anybody else. Isn't it healthy? What happens to us when we see that happen? We all go, ooh, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Don't we? Ooh, ooh, not going to do that. And it puts a healthy fear in us of sinning. That's exactly what he says. It helps us all walk the line when we see that happen. Then verse 22, do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily. Thereby, and thereby share the responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. Selection. Timothy, go slow. Selection must be done slowly and carefully. Don't ever lay hands suddenly on someone. He says, Timothy, do not lay hands hastily, quickly, and thereby share the sin that some do. Isn't that an interesting thought? If we do not test someone carefully and put them into leadership, lay hands on them and put them into some kind of leadership position, but have not tested their character, when they go out and teach either false doctrine or morally shame the church or hurt people, God judges us who laid hands on him or her for their sin and said, you sent that wolf into my, my flock and I will judge you for the damage the wolf does. Ooh. Now, I wish I could say I never saw this happen, but I have done this, or tried to do it, where I can think, and I, I'm, I'll just be real generic, but I have had situations where I've had somebody, and I confess this, this is the most punishment I think God has ever done to me. I'm generally a pretty good guy. In, in that I don't deliberately defy him. Oh, I sin my own sins, but they're nice sins. <laughs> I'm, I'm smooth about it, you know? I don't just take him on. But in this case, oh boy. I took someone who was not ready and who was causing me difficulty and said, so why don't we have you pastor a church? I'm ashamed to admit it. Now, I honestly didn't know the, I, I didn't know the depth of, of the immaturity. The Lord just punished me, and he didn't let up when I said, I'm sorry, or I'll never do it again. He didn't let up. He let that one sting and burn all the way through the cycle. And I'll tell you the lesson I learned. He said, don't you ever put anybody you don't fully trust over my bride. I've heard some people say, well, we're going to put them in a small church, and then if they do damage, they'll only hurt a few. <laughs> I have heard that a bunch of times. I'm not making that up. 
I don't think he thinks that way either. Like, hey, a few of my babes, no problem. I got lots more. He doesn't <laughs> think like that. Now, where this plays out, sometimes people will come into the church and they'll say, Pastor, you know, I've been, I've been in this kind of leadership and this kind of ministry in other churches, and we're just so glad to be here and we'd like to minister. And I look at them and everything in me says, man, what great people, you know, look at their gifts, look at their history. And I want to just say, like tomorrow, let's just put you somewhere. But what holds me back is this verse. Unless I have clear reference from somebody I know, I know, saying I, that this person's indeed got solid Christian character and is exactly who they appear to be, I can't move ahead. This week I was talking to our district supervisor and we were, we were going over this very problem. What do we do when we get an application from someone? We meet them. They, they, they seem great. The, the paper looks fine. And yet we can't really vouch for their character. How do we deal with this? Because it happens all the time. But I, I reminded him, and he kind of grunted when I did. I mean, not, not, not meanly, but like, yeah. I said, boy, Paul says, if they go out and hurt somebody, we get punished for it along with them. And he said, yeah. Paul gives an answer as to why, or gives an explanation. Look at, look at verse uh, 24 and 25. I'm going to come back to 23. You better believe it. But 24 and 25, let me explain this. He says, the sins of some men, and this is explaining 22 is what he's doing. He just made a comment in 23, and now he's 24 and 25. He's explaining why you don't lay hands subtly on somebody or quickly. The sins of some men are quite evident, going before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow after. Timothy, if you quickly lay hands on people, if you don't test them properly, you will find that some of the ones you lay hands on had hidden sins. Some people's sins are quite obvious, but other people lie about them and conceal and have a hidden life. And if you don't watch long enough, you won't know it's there, and you'll end up putting somebody in a ministry position that has a hidden area of character failure, and it's going to hurt the church. Secondly, he says in verse 25, likewise also deeds that are good are quite evident, and those that which are otherwise cannot be concealed. Timothy, you'll also overlook good leaders that you would have missed. There are some people that are obvious. Some people who just have, you know, you can just, in, in a little bit of time, you see the gifting and the character, it just shines through. But some people are quite humble and quite withdrawn. And they won't volunteer, or they won't raise their hand, or they won't jump to the front, or they won't, they won't tell you even what's going on in their life. They're quiet about it. And Timothy, if you go too quickly in setting leaders apart, you're going to miss some of the best gems you've got. Do you know people like that? They just look like a wallflower. They you know, think, who's that? You know, they're just this quiet little person. And then something happens where you just come across what's going on in their life. And you find out that they're the next thing to Mother Teresa, you know. <laughs> but you didn't know anything about them. I just had one of those events this past week at the marriage retreat. I was talking to one family, uh, you know, and, and uh, one person that I, I just assumed was just suffering. And, and find out this person's going down to the cancer hospital and, and, and with uh, caring for uh, parents whose children are dying of cancer every week and who is, who is uh, Pray has a prayer list of 10 children. They're holding up consistently before the Lord and just ministering constantly. I had no idea. I was flabbergasted and blessed enormously. I didn't know that. You see, if you go quick, if you don't wait. I'll tell one story and I move on. <laughs> In Arizona, when we planted a church there, Foursquare does not require you to have a formal business council our council is, uh, is, is, a, is a, an elected officers who are responsible for the financial responsibility, you know, honesty of the church and, and that kind of thing. They don't spiritually lead the church. We don't have a, we don't have a board of elders like, like, a, like a Baptist church might, but we have a business council. But you don't have to have one of those for a few years when you plant a church until it's, until it's mature. But after a, my first year, I thought, boy, I'm tired. I would love to have a council help me, you know, and help me carry all this. So I thought, well, if I were going to pick one, 
And early on, I just get to pick. I don't do that now. But I, and I said, I'd pick him and her and him and her, and that's who I'd have. But I had the good sense. I felt the caution of the Lord saying, no, don't do it. <laughs> and this verse was in my mind. Lay hands suddenly on no man. All right, all right, all right. So I didn't. A year later, I decided, I decided to assess my dream team and see a year later, how would we do? Well, one had been set, was separated from his wife. One was riddled with uh, venereal disease. Uh, another, anyway, all of them, everyone. So some people say, well, can't you use your discernment? <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> I, know, I know some people really pride themselves. You know, I could just read a person. I used to feel that way, too. <laughs> but I'll tell you, my history is I'm a humbled man. I know there's people that are absolute gems that I'll overlook. And there's people that are absolute wolves that I'm likely to put over, you know, some ministry if I move quickly. So it's one of the reasons I'm cautious. And what I generally say is, would you be a mini church pastor? Would you please get into something where we can watch you? I virtually don't trust anybody. Not, but not because my heart doesn't, but because I realize I can be fooled, and there's a deep principle here. By the way, you should, you should choose a church the same way. This is not only selecting leaders, but if I were selecting a church, I would be cautious. And I would go carefully and slowly until my heart really told me, and I saw the Lord's hand in that situation. And I, and I believe people, by and large, do that. And one of the ways they, it's kind of neat. People will come and they'll often be here for a couple of years. And then I'll get this little note. And it'll say, dear pastor, just want to thank you for, for all the Lord ministers through you to me. And tell you what a, what a difference it's made in my life. Now what those notes are saying really is, you're my pastor now. I trust you. I know what it's saying. And it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, not, it's, it's like, it's kind of like falling in love. It's, it's something you can't, you can't dictate. You can't set a date on it. You can't do anything else. It's just a matter of when somebody says, I, I think I trust you. I think I trust you. But that's what ought to happen when in, in, you don't just submit to somebody any more than, I, than we put leaders over people. I wouldn't receive, I wouldn't submit to somebody until my heart was trusting. All right. Um, I'm, oh, I, I'm not going to miss 23. Now, I know people that can, cannot quote John 3.16, but they can quote this verse. <laughs> this is one of the most widely quoted verses in the Bible. <laughs> so it'd be fun to know what it means, wouldn't it? Now, doesn't it look like it's totally out of context? I mean, he just throws this thing about liquor in the middle of his comments and moves on. <laughs> It is not out of context. Let's explain. He has just said, Timothy, be careful in setting leaders in or you'll share their responsibility. And then he says, keep yourself pure, literally, free from sin. No longer drink water only, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. We've learned a couple of things by what he said there. One is probably one of the failings of the leaders in the church in Ephesus was drunkenness. So Timothy, in order to avoid any semblance of evil, in order to make sure that there, nobody can accuse him of misuse of alcohol, has gone to water only in, his drink, in, in, in drinking. He will not even take it. But the water supply in Ephesus clearly is contaminated. So what in, in, in cultures where there is bad water, and I've been in places like this and I've seen this done, Cultures where there's bad water, you take wine and you mix it into the water. One part wine to three parts water. Now that is not some scintillating beverage. What it does is you pour the alcohol in there and it kills the little stuff that's crawling around. So you drink it dead, not alive. <laughs> I have, I've seen water with just scum on the bottom, boy, you know, and you sit there and go, oh man, you know. Timothy was being so careful 
that he wouldn't even do that. He wouldn't mix the wine into his water, lest anyone accused him of drunkenness, because probably we were having to set pastors and leaders out of that church for that very cause of drunkenness. Paul, in the middle of this, says, Timothy, keep yourself pure. And he thinks, and boy, is he keeping himself pure. A little too pure, Timothy. You better put some wine in your water, or you, because I, you mustn't be, keep getting sick and having stomach di disorders and all that's coming with that. That is not a license to go get schnockered, is it? <laughs> Let me just say, I want to make a good clear point here. Christians aren't drinking people. Now, this is not a verse that gives you permission to be a drinker. This is a very specific medicinal issue in which Paul is taking care of his young, young leader. And it is not a license for you to be a drinker. Can you drink a glass of wine privately in your dinner time? Yes, you can. But you have no business in a bar. And we've just had some disgraceful things with, we've had some people who are doing LTGs, going to a bar, and not as a witness, but drinking and placing bets and stuff like that. And then when confronted, say, well, we're out of here. You're legalistic. Call me what you want, sweetheart. You're playing games. If Jesus doesn't change your sex life, if Jesus doesn't change your finances, if Jesus doesn't change your use of alcohol and addictive materials, if Jesus doesn't change your mouth, you're not a Christian. I'm not talking about perfection, but he comes and he changes your life. And if you're not ready for a change, then, then when you are, let us know. When you're ready to be a Christian, let us know. But you can't have it both ways. And one of the reasons the American church is so unprophetic is we are so like everybody else. That's enough prophetic for me. <laughs> Let's go on. Yes. Don't egg me on. I get. <laughs> All right. Let's see what I'm. What what do now? I'm going to talk about caring for leaders. What do elders and overseers and leaders in the church do? Well, in whatever capacity, from Sunday school ushers and greeters and altar workers and and uh, many church pastors, they shepherd and guard the flock. They exhort. We're told that means what I'm doing right now. Exhorting is taking the word and encouraging obedience with it. Teaching sound doctrine. Refuting false doctrine. One of my jobs, one of any good teacher's jobs, is to refute false doctrine. I try to do it without naming names and people and getting a personality clash, but I am not allowed to just allow false, foolish things to go on by and not say anything about it. I have to, if I think it's serious, I have to talk to you about it. And we've had some episodes in our history where I've had to just lay down the gauntlet. False doctrines, dangerous stuff. We have to confront false teachers. That's fun. I'm to discipline, we are, as a church, to discipline the unrepentant. Discipline is a very important part of a church life. When people choose to continue in flagrant immorality, they are to be disciplined. Called in and said, stop it. If you don't, why? Because if you continue in this pattern, you will not go to heaven. That's why. You cannot, Paul gives a list, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10, you can't do these things and go to heaven, he says. Inherit the kingdom of God means be part of the resurrection. I call that going to heaven, wouldn't you? So he says you're not going to go to heaven if you continue to practice these things. Therefore, the church has a responsibility when somebody is trying to play a game. They're trying to be a Christian and live like the devil to call them in and say, this needs to stop. We love you. But you aren't stopping this. And so we're going to set you outside the community of the saved so that you know the condition of your spiritual life. We want you to repent and we want you to come back and we will be the happiest group in town to see you again. See, this is not getting rid of rubbish kind of thing. You don't have, that's a lousy attitude. We love you, but you're out of here. But when you want to repent, would you please come back? Because we want you back. We want you back. In fact, we're going to be praying until we see you again. That's the attitude. And almost always, when that's done properly, someone will sooner or later come back and they'll say these words, thank you for loving me enough. I've heard it dozens of times. 
Thank you for loving me enough to do what you did. And we always say thank you for coming back. Model Christian character. Continue to pray for the church. Pursue strays. I pursued a stray last week. One day I look around, I say, where is that person? I find out they're upset. So I had them come in and I said, so what's this about? And we talked. And we, we, we communicated and I, I think I got my stray back. All right. What are the difficulties if a church has the responsibility to nurture their leaders just as the leaders have a responsibility to nurture the church? Why? Why should we be praying for our leaders? Why should we be caring for them? Why is this important? Well, let me tell you some of the pressures that people who minister, any level, not just me, but any level, they face. First of all, they have the normal personal and family pressures. They got, they got the same stuff with health and weariness, spouses, children, personal disappointments that anybody else goes through, and yet now they have to care for others and give and serve and pray and encourage when their own hearts are sometimes weary and breaking. Secondly, they have a concern for the church. You can't pastor people and not love them, ultimately, and be hurt when they struggle. You say, well, what's that feel like? Well, if you're a parent and your child starts going bad, how do you feel? I don't, there is nothing that gives me cold shivers more than when I hear some parent tell me about their, their, their wandering or struggling child. Man, it just goes right to my gut. I'm a, I'm a father, and I have felt this so deeply, and uh, there's nothing more. And a pastor has the same kind of thing, where someone... Someone wanders away. You say, well, you're not supposed to worry. It's a sin. Well, nah. <laughs> you. I just want you to see for a second that if I sin, then I'm not alone. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. No, I mean, uh, chap 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians 11. Paul says this. After giving this remarkable remarkable list of things that he has suffered. While you're turning there, he says, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times, he says, I received from the Jews, that means from the religious leaders, 39 lashes. They would stretch him over a barrel or something and whip him with a, with a whip 39 times. You know why it was 39? They believed 40 would kill a man. And the Bible says, do not, do not whip them, to, in, uh, a countryman, to disgrace. In other words, the man dies and, and, and their bowels are released and they're shamed in front of everybody. Don't kill them with a whip. So they whipped him 39 times. So he was whipped to the point of near death five times. How many would stay in the ministry after that treatment? <laughs> I can't tell you I would. But this man did. This man did. He was brave beyond measure. Verse 25, he says, three times I was beaten with rods. They also used sticks. Once I was stoned. That's in Lystra, Timothy's hometown. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep, 36 hours floating in the ocean, hanging on to some uh, flotsam and jetsam. I have been on, a frequent, on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, from robbers, from my countrymen, from Gentiles, in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food in cold and exposure. And apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. He says, I'm suffering and worrying and praying for the churches all the time. And he gave him cause for suffering, may I add. Who is, weak, who is weak without my being weak? Who's led into sin without my intense concern? Paul says, not only am I beaten, but my heart aches for the people I pastor. Demonic oppression. When you minister, the devil tries to wear you down. It's really something you need to know. And that's one of the crucial reasons we've got to pray for each other. That if, if we're going to become a church that raises up leaders... And I'm going to get to that, but I think that's what the Lord wants. I think he wants many of you. I know my assignment here. My job is to raise up disciples. 
And I believe the Lord wants to raise leaders for his church widely, not just for here. So many of you are supposed to rise up. And if that's going to happen, we've got to pray for you. And we've got to encourage you and, and, and stand with you. We've got to help one another. This isn't about me. Sure, I'll be happy to be treated nicely, but this is about each other. This is about what God wants to do. And anyone who steps out in ministry, there is a demonic oppression. I deal with it every week. Almost without exception. Before, uh, Saturdays are miserable for me. I'm praying, I'm working it through, I feel, I won't go through all my stuff, but I have my own pressures every week. And I just have to hang on to God and say, I thank you, Lord Jesus, you'll be with us. That's, that's my battle. Well, it's yours too if you minister. Isn't it? So what do we do for each other? Pray. And if the church doesn't learn to pray for its leaders, the leaders can't lead. The ministries can't arise. Our missionaries can't go out. We must care for those who care for us and minister on our behalf. Every bit as much as we expect them to be caring for us. There is a constant struggle for private time and rest. There is scrutiny and criticism. The pastors and their family. It really, it really is frustrating when the family takes the, the hit of this. There is obligation to love and serve people who leave you if you offend them. You know the rules go this way. I have to love you, but you can be rude to me. It is. That's the rules. And I can't ever not like you. I've got to forgive you and pray for you and love you no matter what you do. But lots of people just turn on their heel and walk out. But I still have to love you. I don't have any permission to go, yeah, you know, <laughs> when, you, when you leave. I, or at least I have to repent when I do. <laughs> I do. I can't hold bitterness. And so, frankly, to this day, I've had people that I have to forgive over and over again for five years. When I, when I have to come to that thing in the Lord's Prayer, there's certain names just keep popping up. Lord, I forgive that person. Bless them. I just pray your Holy Spirit's moving powerfully in their life. Because it still hurts. Fear of public speaking. A new sermon every week. Can you imagine? Being socially ostracized by society. Treated strangely and avoided and criticized. Do you know what it is to go into a neighborhood and folks come up and go, Hi, howdy folks. And what do you do? I'm a pastor. Okay. <laughs> I mean, their countenance falls generally. It's like, ooh, icky. <laughs> I've had people, I've had people at night sit out outside at my house, not here, and chant. Preaches a sermon, preacher. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Guys, stank, several people out front going at it. This is not an easy thing to do. Now, compared to Paul, I got nothing. Often in poverty or bivocational and exhausted. Listen to me. For every famous televangelist who falls, and everybody who has a jet and has a Rolls Royce, Rolex watches and Gucci loafers, for every one of those... There are 10,000 men and women that are ministering in virtual poverty, working by vocational, 40 hours a week, exhausted, trying to raise a family, trying to come up with a sermon on Saturday afternoon when they're, when they're, when they're beat, show up Sunday, give all they got, move into some rented facility, move it out again, go home, and start on Monday morning at work again. And it is, it is grotesque. To accuse all the pastors and ministers and say, well, you're all a bunch of con people. You're all frauds. All you do is play golf all week and show up on the weekends. That is ridiculous. Most of the ministers, I mean like 10,000 to one, are poor. And serving Jesus. And many of them have the talents and the gifts and the abilities to have succeeded greatly in life. And could be richer than you but are doing this because they love Jesus Christ. And to have them slandered 
because a few people have grotesquely abused the income. They didn't know what to do with all this money, and rather than give it away, they took some of it, more than they should have. But because they did that, to grotesquely uh, paint everyone with that is sad. Pastors are neither to be put on a pedestal nor vilified. We're, we're human beings. People who minister are human beings. Well, why would anyone, after that list, Steve, want to do this job? It's a good question. First of all, they believe God's called them. This is something you can't put your finger on in, in terms of, and, and prove it, but your heart knows it. How many of you know that God has called you to some clear area of ministry? You know. Raise your hands. See that? Now, if I were to say, prove it, show me a, you know, what did he do it? How do you know? You say, I don't know how I can tell you, but I just know I'm supposed to do this. I just know I'm supposed to do this. God calls men and women to his service. Secondly, they are deeply convinced of heaven and hell. Generally, anyone who's willing to pay a price like that has awakened to spiritual reality. They know there is hell, and they know there is heaven. I was just speaking in, in uh, Oregon at a, at a camp for training our future church planters. And they asked me to come in and do seven and a half hours of lecture on preaching. And we got on some, this discussion somehow. And one of, the, one of the pastors that was there was already several, I had a, several pastors who've been ministering also sitting. And one of the pastors was a Latino brother from uh, National City uh, in San Diego area. And we got on this discussion somehow and he said, I don't pastor anymore because I love pastoring. He said that wore out a while ago. He said, I do this because I know there's a heaven and I know there's a hell. And he said, I can't stand seeing people go to hell. Man, you know, we're all just sucking air. This was a heart, real heartfelt thing that came out of it. I'll tell you, there's so many men and women. That's why they're doing it. They know this is a, they, they've seen, they've seen heaven. They've seen hell. They know the realities. And they say, I can't sit by and just buy myself a new car and a boat while the world's perishing. I've got to make a difference. And they are. They feel God's love for his people. I don't, can't say I just love people. But I can tell you this. I can feel his love for you and for me too. And the more I feel his love, the more I tend to love too. But it's hard to separate. God loves us. And when you serve him, you can feel his great longing for people. He makes me love and be kind and serve people I don't like. <laughs> or hurt me and make me mad. In the natural, I'd react a totally different way. But I can feel his love for you, and I just, he, do not, he will not let me follow my temper. He will not let me follow my own pride. He says, you love them, they're mine. You know that feeling? That's what motivates people that minister. They love the feeling God's pleasure when they serve. The Holy Spirit's anointing is nothing sweeter than sensing God's pleasure when you minister. When you've served the Lord... Not just doesn't have to do with just preaching, but you're, when you've stepped out and done what you're told and you feel the anointing and you see the fruit, isn't that, isn't that beautiful? I mean, doesn't that make you just think like, oh, man. That's what life's about, people. That's what life's about. And that's what motivates people who minister. Well, and how, what are some of the ways we can honor leaders? First of all, pray for them. And this is not a platitude. We must pray. You get your lists out. You get your Lord's Prayer brochure and can you start praying for, for the leaders. And, and I'll, I'll be happy to receive prayer. But you include all the men and women. You include the people, the, the Sunday school teachers that are teaching your children and the, and the youth workers that are ministering to your youth. You pray for them. You pray for our women's ministries. You pray for our nursery workers. You pray for everybody. You pray for the missionaries we've got. You pray for people that you know are ministering. Hold them up in prayer. Make it a discipline. Don't just do it when you feel it. Secondly, tell them when God ministers well through them. This is different from flattery. Flattery is when you come up and say, you're just wonderful. You're just so marvelous. You know, when you come up to somebody and say that to them, they're, they're given this choice, either believing you and sinning, 
or just turning it off altogether. And so it doesn't do any good. It doesn't help because if I receive it, I'm sinning. If I don't receive it, it it's like you're just an annoyance. It would have been better if you hadn't. Here's how you can encourage a leader. Tell them what God is doing in your life. And if they had a part in it, you can say, well, the Lord really ministered through you. I really received. But focus and boast on God. Because I'll tell you why people are ministering. It isn't an ego trip. I mean, sure, there's a few people like that, but we know who they are. You can spot them. But most by far, the majority of men and women who minister, minister because they long to see God touch people. And when, they, when somebody comes up and says, God just ministered so strongly, I am, uh, he's just blessed me so much, that person inside is going, oh, yeah. And they just want to do it more and more because they want to see God touch people. So tell them what God's done for you. Boast on God, and it will encourage them no end. Number three, Cooperate unless your conscience is violated. Now, cooperation is a, an unusual word in the American culture. But let me tell you, it's a helpful one. I believe this, that if God's put me into some kind of family or some sort of situation, and I agree to it, that there's a lot I can cooperate with even when I don't agree with it. Now, if it violates my conscience, if it steps into immorality or some serious error or heresy or something is sick, really sick about it. That's one thing. But just because they ask me to do things I don't want to do doesn't mean I don't do them. I do things all the time I'm asked to do. I'm a man under authority also. I have authority over me. And I do what I'm told. That to me is just part of being on a team. How would you have a team when you said, all right, you know, Flanagan, go play second base. He says, I don't want to. I want to play first. Well, I got somebody at first. Tough. I want to play first. You know, you can't run a team like that. If everybody just does what's right in their own eyes, you have anarchy. And the body of Christ is the same way. And so we need to cooperate with our leaders. They say, we want to have a potluck. Let's bring some. Bring something and show up. Do what you're asked to do. What will happen is there's tremendous strength in that. When people begin to pull together... There's tremendous strength in it. I have been just, I've had people where I asked them maybe to, to dress a certain way on the platform. Just, just a simple way. I'm, you know, we're not wearing full length suits and stuff. But just dress a certain way. They just turn and walk on me and say, I'm a control freak. I don't think that's a control freak. I think I'm the senior pastor of the church. I have a right to say I'd like a certain level of dress up here. Would you, would you mind? And if I'm just a nut and an old fashioned Weirdo, well, so be it. <laughs> but I've not violated your conscience here. I'm not asking something. This is not some kind of, of, of unhealthy level of, of leadership. Maybe I'm stupid. Give me time to learn. But maybe I have reasons. Maybe I don't want folks looking at your knees or whatever. And, and I'd like a modesty to it or something. That's my call. That's my call. And you can cooperate without calling me a control freak and going to other places and spreading gossip about me. But I've put up with quite a bit of that. And I'll bet you have too when you lead, because that's the American way right now. I follow as long as I agree. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. That is not called submission. And submission is not a bad word. When, that, when someone requires something of me that's immoral, ungodly, when they begin to dominate my life, you bet, I step out of that in a heartbeat. Nobody's asking you to submit to that. But to cooperate in a team-like spirit when, when various rules are being set down and the ways of approaching things, yes, we can do that, we must. If we're going to have healthy churches and, and leaders that aren't just brokenhearted. It's hard to lead people that won't follow. All right. Tell them when you are hurt or seriously disagree. Now, when you are hurt and seriously disagree, it is a way of honoring a person to go up and tell them. I'll tell you, the devil gets involved in this. He'll make you think somebody doesn't like you, even when nothing like that has gone through their heart. And if you don't say something, there'll be constant separation. I can think of a situation where, where we were in a meeting, and one person, a, a comment was being made by somebody, 
I think by, I was making a comment about something, and one of our other leaders happened to glance at another leader as I said it. And that person immediately thought we were gunning for, that, for them. Now, the person I'm talking about is one of the finest, most giving, serving people at Northwest Church. And such a thought had never, ever gone through our brains. But the devil convinced that person it had. And for two years, I just wondered where that person was. What was going on? And finally, they came and said to me, I just need to ask you, did you mean that about me? And I thought, I, I want to laugh is what I wanted to do. I want to go, you're kidding. Why would I think that about you? But they did. And for years, they were hurting over that. People, the devil will see to it that those sort of things come along. And one of the ways we honor our leaders is by going and saying, this thing hurt me. I don't know if you meant it, but I need you to tell me this is what I heard. If they say, yeah, I meant it, and I was hoping that you'd get it, well, <laughs> fair enough. But very often you'll find it is a miscommunication or just needed to be talked out. Fifthly, don't speak badly about them behind their backs. If you have something to say, you really do need to talk about them. And you know if you don't talk to their face, you'll talk behind their back. It's automatic. So it simply means you have to go talk to the person. That takes a level of courage, doesn't it? And we also need to learn some skills. That when we go to somebody, we don't have to just let them have it. We can say, what you said hurt me. We need to learn some communication skills, just like we do for our marriages. And say, what you said hurt me. Or this upsets me. What can we do about it? And then you try to work it out together. That'll make some real strength. If you persistently resent the pastor, leave graciously. I have a family member, not in this state, so it has nothing to do with this church. And that person is very unhappy with their church. And they've tended there for years. And then when we visit and all, we hear about the frustrations of the pastor. And finally, I said to this family member, I said, I really think you should leave that church. I said, what's happening is you're modeling for your children to complain about the pastor. I mean, how can they put their heart into that church when, when their parents feel the way you, they do? And secondly, it's bad for you. You need to be refreshed and fed. You need to come home from a church service feeling better, not worse. And if week after week you come away angry and hurt and, 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 and all of that, all it's doing is drying you up. It would be better you didn't go to church than you went like that. And so sometimes we're in situations where the pastor or the leader of whatever the ministry is just isn't like us. And we wait for a while and figure they're going to finally wake up and become more like us. But they may not. For, for, for example, with, with me, I'm... We're pretty well looking at it. I mean, I, yes, I hope this church will, will rise up in a whole bunch of things. and We're trying to do a lot of things better. But fundamentally, the value system is pretty in place. And if you say, I don't like it. Well, there are probably other churches which are doing things differently. And you need to be somewhere where you really are enthusiastic. And so that you can not just sit there and cross your arms and scowl, but so that you can serve. You need to be, you need to be excited and think, this is cool. We've got to do this. We've got to really go for this. That's where you're best. It's where you're happy and where you're, where you're one heart with the, with the church. Tell them why you when you leave and why. When you do leave, there's a big difference between leaving a church and abandoning a church. And when you just disappear, that's abandonment. I think one way of honoring your leaders is to say, we're leaving and here's why. It's, a, it's just plain respect. I had somebody leave the other uh, a month or two ago. And they, I had probably lots of people. They, these people wrote me a letter. <laughs> and they wrote me a letter and they said, Steve, we're leaving. Actually, we're already gone. Because one, you speak in tongues and don't always interpret it. And I think what they meant is that sometimes I hold the microphone and I might be praying in the spirit. And, I, and, and when we all were worshiping and they heard that and it wasn't interpreted. I, anyway. Secondly, you have women in leadership. I said, well, why don't you come in and talk to me? They said, no, we're already gone. Now, I want you to know, I appreciate their writing me that letter. I, it allows me to think, understand why they left. 
allows me to think through what we're doing, saying, Lord, is this, you know, is there some things I should adjust here? And, and let's know where they are. That's a respectful thing to do. No, I'm sorry they left. But I appreciate being told. You'd be surprised when you just disappear on somebody. They notice. Even in here, you think, well, this is a big church. I know your faces. I may not know your names, but I know you. And I, take, I, I, I watch. I'm not taking a role. But I, I, there's a sense. I don't know how to say it. It's a pastoral thing. I know who's here, and I'll find, where is that person? And it's really sad to go running around and saying, where is that person? Are, are they ill? Would, would somebody find out what's happened to them? Because I haven't seen them in a, about a month now, and I think something's maybe wrong. And to find, well, no, they've just all left and gone somewhere else. It's, it's just like being walked out on in a, in, a, in, a, in a marriage or something. You know, you just wake up one morning, and they're gone. It's kind of ugly that way. It's much nicer if you just come and say, or write a letter and sign it, and <laughs> unsigned letters are kind of nasty. I mean, it's a little, it's abusive is what it is. It really is abusive. If you don't have the courage to sign your name, don't say it. But to, to write mean things and then not sign it is like throwing a rock through somebody's window or something. It's just cowardly. And it doesn't allow for any dialogue. Honoring one another, honoring our leaders, caring for our leaders involves these kinds of things. It's a very practical thing. All right, what's the point of all this? Folks, if we learn to honor one another, to release our leaders, to pray for our leaders, to nurture our leaders, you know what will happen? We'll have a great crop of leaders grow up. We're going to have men and women released in their ministries that never would have been released in a critical or a harsh environment or a, or a prayerless environment. They never would have. The devil would have just beaten them down and they never got to first base. But when a church that prays and a church that loves them and a church that stands with one another, we're going to have men and women rise into their ministries at levels we never believed possible. This isn't about me. This is about us. You understand?